Welcome, welcome. This is our, well, this is Theracil's um, webinar on psilocybin therapy as a potential treatment option for eating disorders. I'm just gonna let people trickle in. Um, and we ask that if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat, um, sorry, pop them in the Q&A function. If you have any uh, thing you wanna discuss, just pop it in the chat function. Um, you also have the option to individually message the panelists as well. Um, looks like we're stable around 21 people right now. Hey, Paulina. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll probably wait maybe 30 more seconds and then get started. But uh, in the meantime, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Holly. I am the communications director at Theracil. And uh, I'm joined today by three lovely panelists um, from actually all across the globe, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment. So um, again, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you do have any questions, put them in the Q&A function. We'll save some time at the end. Um, if you do have any um, you know, comments um, or discussions you wanna make amongst yourselves, feel free to put that in the chat function. Um, I will make just a little bit of a safety disclaimer. Uh, we wanna cultivate a really safe space on this Zoom today. So. Um, there's many folks on this call who may be in various stages of recovery. So just to make sure that we are having a safe space. Uh, if you do have questions um, or you are, you know, chatting in the chat function, we ask that you refrain from any language around specific eating disorder um, symptoms or behaviors, um, specifically around also dieting or body focused language um, and any numbers, um, including, you know, weight or calories. So. You're also not sure if anything is triggering and, and you're not sure if you, you should ask it, uh, feel free to message me or another panelist and, and we can help you out with that. So um, before we get going, um, yeah, my name is Holly, uh, pronouns are she, her. I'm based in Toronto. And so I'd also like to do a little bit of a land acknowledgement. Um, Toronto is the traditional uh, territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. And it's now home to many diverse nations, including First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis people. Um, and I also recognize that um, our team, we are talking about uh, psilocybin mushrooms that have been used for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years, um, indigenous cultures throughout the world. Um, and we do recognize and acknowledge that uh, our ability to have this discussion today really rests on the shoulders of indigenous populations across the world. and. Uh, we, we thank them and acknowledge them for that. So yeah, um, I guess for anybody who's new on the call, who may be new to Theracil, just wanted to give a little bit of an update who we are, what we're up to these days. So um, Theracil, we're a nonprofit patient advocacy group. Uh, we're based in Victoria, BC, um, although myself, I'm in Toronto, as I mentioned. Uh, and we believe that psilocybin, uh, medical psilocybin and psilocybin therapy should be accessible for all Canadians in medical need, regardless of your indication or diagnosis. So um, what we have been doing is we've been helping patients across the country apply for these, they're called se fifth, uh, Section 56 exemptions. And these exemptions basically allow an individual to use and possess psilocybin um, in a medical and therapeutic context. Most of these patients have been individuals with um, an end of life diagnosis or a palliative diagnosis, for example, um, you know, stage four cancer or ALS. A, a handful of these individuals have been folks who are in remission from cancer um, or in remission from other life-threatening illnesses. Um, we also have submitted exemptions for um, folks who have uh, cluster headaches, uh, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and substance use disorders, yet none of those exemptions have been approved yet. Um, we're very well aware that this exemption process, it is not ideal to access health care. Um, so we are actively pushing towards regulatory change as well, so that in the future, hopefully in the, the near future, you could go to your physician or your nurse practitioner and they could prescribe you medical psilocybin and psilocybin therapy. So no longer is this a decision made between a patient and the highest levels of government. This is a decision, like all other healthcare decisions, that's made between a patient and their primary healthcare provider. So that's what we're working towards. We also train healthcare practitioners in how to facilitate um, this uh, modality for patients, specifically for end of life distress, but we are broadening our training. Uh, we've got eight training cohorts going at the moment and several more launching um, next year in 2022. 
Uh, we've also launched our first research study um, in collaboration with Imperial College London and McGill University. Yay! Um, and that is looking at observational data for folks who do have exemptions who are accessing psilocybin therapy in the real world. Basically, does it work? And uh, how do we quantify what does it work means? Um, and as I mentioned, we are advocating for a regulatory change. We've submitted regulations to the Minister of Health and to Health Canada saying, look, we, we've done the work for you. Here, here's regulations. You could implement these. Um, and we're advocating for those to be implemented. Uh, we're always looking for consultation on that too. So if you have any questions um, or would like to, to learn more about it, you can go to our website, therisol.ca. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, and then I'll introduce myself a little bit more in detail. Um, so Ellen, how about you go ahead and uh, say who you are and why you're here? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm Ellen Dom. I'm a re registered psychologist and I'm here on the traditional unceded territory of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, otherwise known as Woodlands, North Vancouver, BC. I'm really grateful to be a steward of this beautiful property. And um, as I said, I'm a registered psychologist. Uh, I was retired for a period of time and decided to come out of retirement in order to focus on this work, specifically on psychedelics for eating disorders. And, um, and yeah, just really grateful to be here. I'm sure I'll talk more. Thanks. Thanks, Ellen. Nikita, how about you? Uh, thank you, Holly. Um, yeah, it's such an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Nikita. I'm a uh, third year psychiatry uh, resident in training here in Toronto. Um, and really, I, again, I'm so thrilled to have the chance to be on this panel. A lot of what drove me to pursue a career in, uh, in mental health and psychiatry was based on my own personal experiences and, and those of many, many people that I've seen <laughs> struggle through the system. And so I, I'm really hopeful about, uh, about the future and the potential that these treatments hold. Thanks, Nikita. We're glad you're here. And uh, Meg. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me here. My name is Meg Spriggs. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College of London. Um, as you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm not from London. Um, I'm originally from New Zealand, um, which is where I did my PhD. Um, and during my PhD, which was in psychology and neuroscience, um, I was um, you know, I, I was I was drawn to this field because of, uh, you know, uh, the changing the, that we need to sort of find new approaches to mental health. And I was really interested in, in, in exploring new approaches and changing the way, um, you know, we treat um, mental health across the board. And and I was, um, you know, watching this uh, this research being done at Imperial College and watching um, the work work of Robin Kaha Harris and David Nutt um, uh, from the other side of the world. And, and I reached out to them and I said, you know, have you thought about a trial in eating disorders, um, anorexia? You know, there's there's not a lot out there at the moment for people struggling with eating disorders. And um, you know, you're making such great headway with depression. Have you thought about eating disorders? And, and it happened to be that, that Robin was having a similar thought at a similar time and, and we got talking and, and here I am a few years later um uh, uh working on our trial um so i'm leading our trial looking at psilocybin assisted therapy for anorexia nervosa which is now underway at imperial college and i'm sure that people might have questions about that so i'm happy to talk about um our trial design and, and things like that um so yeah thank you so much awesome thanks so much meg yeah i personally have lots of questions about the research study so excited to talk about that um, and just to introduce myself a little bit more robustly, as I mentioned, uh, I'm the communications director at Therasil, so my role mostly involves um, all of our public facing public education and advocacy work, um, so educating folks through through means like this webinars on you know what is psilocybin therapy, what indications can it help, what do we know, what do we don't know, and then advocating for um, it to be accessible for everybody in medical need. Um, the reason we're doing this webinar today is um, because a lot of our webinars in the past have been very, very clear cut. You know, psilocybin therapy, it, it works for, for end of life distress. There's, there's studies that show it. We have anecdotal evidence that shows it. Um, similarly, we did um, a webinar on psilocybin therapy for substance use disorder. Again, there's, there's really great studies that show it works. There's anecdotal evidence. And um, I personally, as you may have seen from my email last week when we had to cancel, and thank you for everybody for being flexible with your timing and able to, to make it today. 
Um, I have lived experience with an eating disorder. I was diagnosed with an eating disorder 10 years ago. Um, I am very much in recovery slash I would consider myself wholly recovered. Um, big shout out to my parents who I believe are also on the line for you know quickly getting in me getting me into a hospital program for us living in an area where there was support available. Um, but I also know that my experience of being able to access treatment quickly um, and also, you know, geographically near me um, is, is not, it is actually quite unique. I know there's a lot of people who don't have access to current mental health treatment options for eating disorders. And even those who do, they don't work for everybody. And, and a lot of the current treatment options, they're really not successful for dare I say a majority of, of the population and perhaps we can get into some numbers if anybody has numbers on you know the success rates of our current treatment options for eating disorders um, but I would say my story is pretty unique in that I was able to be you know diagnosed pretty quickly and then enter a treatment program pretty quickly as well um, and I believe that eating disorders deserve our full attention they deserve a full investigation into the various different treatment options available and um, perhaps psilocybin therapy and psychedelic psychotherapy is one of those treatment options. So um, our webinar today will be very exploratory in nature. It's going to be discussion based. And so with that, um, I think we could lay some groundwork with just discussing, you know, what is an eating disorder just to get some definitions on the table. Um, is there anybody who wants to start off with that? I'd be happy to kind of, yeah, kick things off. Um, so I guess when we, when we think about eating disorders, um, it's, a, it's a diagnosis. And eating exists on a spectrum of kind of what we think of as healthy, typical relationships with food to the other end being kind of like this, a, a, a diagnosis of an eating disorder. And at least like here in Canada, what we use is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, so the DSM that people have heard of. And that really like it, it categorizes eating disorders into these like neat diagnostic boxes that don't necessarily apply to all to all folks, but that, that's kind of the, the working definitions we have. So there are several different uh, eating disorders that um, people can be diagnosed with. So some of the more common ones that people have heard of would be anorexia nervosa, um, bulimia nervosa, and uh, there's also binge eating disorder. And just delving a little bit into some of the, the differences um, with, with anorexia nervosa that tends to be primarily of an eating disorder that's restricting, there is a binge purge subtype of that. Um, and often leads people to get into a lot of medical trouble, um, a lot of weight loss. And uh, so, so that's kind of what characterizes that one. And then bulimia in contrast, um, it, there, there's, periods of uh, binge eating and then also kind of purging behavior to, yeah, to compensate. And um, people with bulimia may not necessarily be as underweight and, and they're still very clearly struggling. So that's another kind of complication in the system is sometimes people don't receive the care or attention they need um, because they're simply not medically unstable yet. It's a very reactionary system. Um, but those are, those are kind of the main, the main diagnosis. I'd love for others to jump in. I'd like to add that the, the DSM um, lists behaviors that are associated with these, these different categories. And, and that's, that's helpful for insurance purposes and to give us a vocabulary that we can agree on to be able to talk about these concepts. Um, internal family systems is a model of therapy that's really offered a whole new vocabulary or way of conceptualizing eating disorders as um, a reaction to trauma and um, early experience and the development of certain parts with these behaviors that have been cast into a role that they, that, that they compulsively continue to try to fulfill. And we can, we can talk more or less about that if, if you care to, but um, I think that with the DSM, it, it, the, has really offered a broader scope of understanding what's going on. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to delve into that more with you, Ellen, over this, this call, because that's a fascinating, you know, what, what um, internal family systems offers is, is fascinating. And I'd, I'd love to learn more. Um, 
Um, but I'd also just like to chip in and, and say, I, I really appreciate um, Nikita as well, how you introduced it as, as you know, these are our diagnoses. And um, I would also say that, that, you know, most of our society actually has a pretty unhealthy unre relationship with food and, and their bodies. And, and we live in a society where it's, everything is about sort of, um, you know, counting calories and weight loss and all of those kinds of things that are kind of thrown at us all of the time. And so it's understandable that that people develop these relationships with food that that are not that that are not necessarily healthy. Um, there also, a, a, you know, there is increased recognition of a lot of um, disordered eating that doesn't necessarily fit the criteria. Things like orthorexia is is being um, increasingly recognised, which is more kind of uh, a, a specific focus on very healthy foods. Um, uh, and in this environment, um, this environment of of being surrounded by um, these kind of uh, what I would say unhealthy relation uh, uh, unhealthy relationships with food makes the recovery process really difficult for someone um, coming through an eating disorder. Um, so it's it's a product of 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 our society as well. Is is what I would add to that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And that that makes me think that you know if somebody doesn't fit into the neat and tidy box of what's in the DSM, how how can they access treatment or even can they access treatment because you know they, they don't tick all the boxes yet do they still have a unhealthy relationship with food or exercise or, or whatnot um have any of you seen that in your your current roles about just people not able to get help um, absolutely and i think it's particularly now um when services are so so stretched um since the pandemic people are calling um, eating disorders a shadow pandemic because mm -hmm. it's basically a perfect storm for someone to develop or relapse um, into an eating disorder and services now I don't know what it's like in Canada but services in the UK are incredibly stretched our um, I, I can't quite remember the stats apart from that um, beat which is the leading charity for eating disorders in the UK um, they've seen an 80% increase in calls to their helplines during the pandemic. Um, and because of that, services are only able to accept the people who are most severe. So people are not getting the help early. And I think we've all touched already on, on how important it is to, um, to get that treatment. Well, you did particularly, Holly, that, that how important early intervention is. Um, and people are not receiving that right now and and if people don't fit those very specific criteria particularly the criteria related to body weight um which is uh, you know um we can talk about how you know that i think we'd all agree that that's not necessarily the the, the most important um criteria but that is uh, tied into the medical criteria so those are the people who are getting the most help and and um while that's absolutely 100 percent necessary that those people get that help it does mean that other people are missing out And I think something to add as well is is just the idea that and I would echo that in Canada it's very very similar. There's like all the major newspapers are, are publishing about this, and especially with children and adolescents, there's been like huge spike, and there's there just there aren't the resources to deal with it. And I think something that's also been frustrating is that there's there's this lack of resources, and at the same time, it's kind of the the current treatments like. It's a, it's a revolving door. So even if somebody does get into the hospital, that doesn't mean that they're going to get better or that they're, it, it's so kind of, we're striving for something, striving for something. And then with eating disorders, I think as like Ellen and, and Meg have so wonderfully pointed out, these are multifactorial, biological factors play in, psychological, social trauma. And when we treat eating disorders right now, based on the DSM, we treat the symptom, we treat the eating, we, we, we don't treat the underlying issues. And again, it, that's, it's a huge problem. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Nikita. I'm wondering if we could actually dig into that a little bit more, particularly, you know, what are the current treatment options? And I'll speak a little bit to more to my experience. I was in a, you know, a seven month outpatient hospital program that was pretty intense. It was like, you know, nine to six, Monday to Friday. It was my full-time job to recover. And I luckily had supports, you know, past that in terms of therapy and, you know, a, a very healthy family dynamic to help me get better and supports and all that. But I know a lot of people in my program, they're, you know, they do the hospital stay, they leave, and then that's it. And so like that, you know, 
that's not uh, that's not really conducive to recovery when you know you, all you're doing is you know being refed, have a little bit of therapy in the hospital, and then have to you know go back to your daytime job, go back into the environment that may have made you sick in the first place. So, what are the current treatment options that are available um, here and in the UK? And I, I presume they might be similar, but let's start there. Oh, Nikita, you're on. Sorry. The yeah, I guess in terms of like the different kind of levels of care, um, as you mentioned, so we have kind of going from least intensive. So there's outpatient supports or there's really there's also like community support groups and, and lots of different great organizations in the community that are kind of separated from the, the more medical model of treatment. Um, and those can really provide a lot of a lot of relief for, for folks and their families and uh, caregivers and loved ones. Then moving into like the medical the medical system, we have outpatient programs here. So those are kind of the least intensive. People would be typically like seeing a psychiatrist uh, to and uh, like a team usually with multidisciplinary input. So social workers, psychologists, dietitians, uh, nurses, um, among others. And um, again, it's they're they're living at home. They're in their regular environment, but they have appointments and they get checked up on. And then we can kind of move up a, a step. There's day hospital programs. Um, so those are kind of, yeah, it's like a nine to five job. You go in, uh, children, adolescents, they, they often get some kind of schooling through that. And you're kind of having your meals monitored. You're there. It's more when you're worried a bit more about uh, people's ability to kind of stick with a plan on their own if they need some more support. Um, but there's no kind of acute safety risks. That, that may be when someone's suitable for that level of care stepping it up again. Then we have, I guess here in Canada, we kind of go up to like inpatient treatments in, in the States. Uh, there's residential treatment centers, which are uh, like people are staying there. It can be kind of like a blend between the day hospital and the like an acute inpatient ward in that people have some, uh, some more autonomy, um, but we don't have many of those like in the publicly funded system in Canada, at least. Um, there are some private options for, and huge wait lists and huge costs associated. But um, if we think about like inpatient treatment, really those units, they're very limited. I mean, there's often a handful of beds scattered across the province or the country and people are on huge waiting lists for these. But in that setting, it's really about like acute medical stability. Somebody's electrolytes are off and they're worried that they could go into heart failure. Um, that's, and beyond that though, people are often discharged once they're medically stable. That's like the term we always hear. And there really isn't, there's not a lot of therapy, like that's not the setting for people to really receive therapy. It's not when people are so malnourished, they aren't going to be receptive to it. And so it's really a, a place for refeeding and it can be, yeah, quite, quite, um, kind of traumatic for folks often. And it, especially it's there's a lot of ethical issues that come up with it again it's like people are at risk of, of dying uh, should they not kind of receive nutrition and are we really helping when if they leave there's no kind of ongoing support uh, so yeah those, those are the main levels of care please chime in with everything I'm sure I missed that's great Nikita thanks Ellen or Meg do you have anything to add in terms of options for people no, it's um, it, it. I think Nikita really uh, you covered pretty much everything. I'm a, I'm a private practitioner. It, I do outpatient therapy, and um, and I, I mentioned I came back out of retirement in order to do this work. And during COVID, I got reinstated. And as soon as I put my shingle back out there in the form of a website the outpouring of need was so overwhelming. I think within two weeks, I had a full caseload and found myself doing Zoom meetings for you know, many, many hours a day for the better part of the year. And that's not, that's not healthy for, for, for me and not healthy for the people that I'm, I'm working with. It's really hard to be present. And so we, we uh, really are in a crisis of um, care for care modes these days during this pandemic. Yeah. I, I guess I, 
I spoke to kind of like the different settings for care in terms of the different like treatments. Uh, if we think about, sometimes we think about, yeah, in, in psychiatry, we have medications, there's like a pharmacological approach to things. And really there, there isn't much evidence for, for a lot of success with, with medications. I think um, they're often used and kind of prescribed off label um, as we call it for, for certain symptoms. So people may receive like benzodiazepines to help them with anxiety and a lot of comorbid conditions can get treated often people with eating disorders. It's not just an eating disorder. There's depression, there's anxiety, there may be substance use and complex trauma histories. And so all of these things play together. So maybe some medications can help ameliorate some of those symptoms. And there, there really isn't much that is specifically shown to have really helped, I think, with eating disorders from my understanding. Um, there's also then the psychological approaches if we think about different therapies. And I'd love to hear more about IFS. It's something I've only recently learned about, but it sounds so, it really resonates. And typically like CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and is one, one mode that's, that's offered. There's dialectic behavior therapy, um, often for people with bulimia nervosa that, that can get used. People can get individual or group, but again, often having to go to the private system because it's so, so long the waiting list and it, it really isn't it, it's not accessible for a lot of people I guess another thing is with children and adolescents uh, specifically the main kind of what's touted as a gold standard is the modsley like family-based treatment approach and one thing to note is that when we talk about like treatments and, and evidence-based it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a strong evidence for something it may be the only thing that they've got any evidence on so Unfortunately, things don't get studied. There's no funding in eating disorders research, and we can postulate as to why that may be a variety of factors. But I, I think that it, it's really been unfortunate that there are, so that treatment, for example, the family issue may work for some people, especially if it's caught early. And also it can not work for a lot of people. It can, and, and there can be discouragement because people are told, oh, well, this is the treatment. And if you don't get better, you're failing treatment. And I really don't like that terminology. Like patients don't fail treatment. Treatment fails patients and we need to do better. And so I'm sorry, I'm like rambling on and on and on. I'll stop it in a second. But yeah, that, that's kind of the things we offer right now. There may be some studies on it. And the thing is we just haven't explored these other options. So I'll leave it at that. That's great, Nikita. Please continue to ramble. I love it. Um, and I mean, you you set us up perfectly for yeah. There there may be other treatment options, which is why this discussion is happening. I, could somebody set up for us? You know, for those who may not know, what is psilocybin therapy or psychedelic psychotherapy? If we want to broaden it a little bit, and how could that maybe help somebody with an eating disorder? I'll open the floor. Can I, I, I wouldn't mind sharing my personal experience and going out on a bit of a limb here, but um, I, I think I consider myself living proof of the efficacy of psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, oh, well over 30 years ago uh, in, the, in the late eighties, um, I was struggling with a life-threatening eating disorder. That, at that time, I was probably 10 years in to my struggle with both anorexia and bulimia. It was really hovering at a very low weight after my second hospitalization. And I, I had tried everything, individual, group therapy, 12-step therapy, two hospitalizations, and um, had the good fortune to connect with a couple who were seriously studying the work of Stanislav Graf. And, um, and that took me on as a project as, and, um, and we, we spent um, several months in um, treatment. It was no party. It was uh, you know, serious therapeutic sessions and it wasn't magic, so to speak. It, it wasn't automatic. It, it took a number, of, a, a number of, of sessions, but eventually over the course of the summer, I was completely transformed. I, um, I was able to clearly see from a different perspective what I was doing to myself behaviorally, 
where it came from historically. And I was able to finally develop a sense of self-compassion and respect that no other therapy was offered me. It was all behavioral. And, um, and so I was, I was able to change my behavior because I, I developed a, a real readiness for it and um, you know, made it my mission to bring those insights from those sessions into my work as a, as a therapist without the medicine. Never talked about it for over 30 years, really until I read Michael Pollan's book and decided I needed to get back to work. So um, I think psychedelics just offer so much promise for treating the root of of the problem in a way that our conventional methods just don't do. Thanks for sharing that, Ellen. Sure. Yeah, I, I'll say as well, thank you so much for sharing that, Ellen. I was totally engrossed in your story just then. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And um, I can chime in now a little bit and talk about what, um, psychedelic therapy looks like in um, one of our trials. Um, so, um, so the model that we use is, is I think probably the most um, widely used sort of model for psychedelic therapy where um, I like to think of it as kind of like a three pronged approach um, and each prong is as important as the others. Um, the first is preparation. Um, so every participant who comes through a study at Imperial will be paired with two guides. Um, and um, the first phase is just giving the guides. And sorry, I don't know if you can hear in the background, my neighbors are arriving home. Um, uh, uh, the, the first job or the first part of preparation is, is building a trusting uh, relationship between the guides, therapists and, and the participant. Because um, we know that trust is a really important component of what comes next. Um, and also during preparation, it's about giving participants some of, or talking through some of the skills and tools for navigating the psychedelic experience. Um, then they'll come back to our center um, for a, a dosing session. Um, different trials have different numbers of dosing sessions, um, but a dosing session is typically run by the participants coming in, in the, at the beginning of the day. Um, we, um, we are in a, in a medical clinic, but we make our clinical rooms feel nice and comfortable and homely. We use blankets and um, dim the lighting and have nice nature pictures on the walls and things to make people feel really comfortable and at home. Um, we then spend um, a, you know, a bit of time at the, beginning, at the beginning of the day, again, preparing, um, a participant will then take their dose um, and they'll be given an eye mask and headphones. Um, and that's really to encourage people to go on an inward journey. Um, and the music that we use is specially designed. Music is a, a really important component of the experience itself and, and it ebbs and flows with the psychedelic experience. Um, the dosing sessions last for about sort of, well, the, 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 the effects of the psilocybin last for about sort of um, four to six hours. Um, and the, the participant will remain in the room with the guides for the entire day. Um, so both the guides are there. And while there might not be a lot of talking and interaction during the day, if the participant needs anything, the guides are there with them the entire time. And that trust um, that, that they're there for that sort of safe container is really, really important. Um, so that's the dosing phase. And then the next phase is integration. And, and I think that this, to me, this is where the real work, in some ways, this is where the real work begins. Um, so while this, the dosing session, the psychedelic experience can open a door, um, integration is about walking through that door and taking that learning forward. Um, so it starts the day after dosing, although you know you could argue that it starts before dosing, that it starts during preparation. Um, uh, but um, that's when the talking will start really. So the, the participant will spend time with their guides really talking through their experience, where they went, where they went on their journey, um, what they experienced, what they learned. Um, although we, we don't necessarily and, and encourage people to try and make sense of everything that day. Um, it's the beginning of the process. And, and the integration will then go on um, for, you know, it can go on for days, weeks, months, years after someone's um, had a, a, a therapeutic experience with psychedelics. Um, uh, 
but it's really about taking forward those lessons and integrating them into their life. And I think this is also really important to recognize when it comes to, to sort of recovery from, from an eating disorder, because um, as opposed to many other mental health conditions, I think uh, eating disorders are unique in, in that recovery is really a very active process. Um, it's, you have to engage in recovery every day. And, and it can be a really uncomfortable experience experience for some people and um so you know the the integration process and the recovery process they're 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 long journeys and another thing that we kind of bring in really important in our trial is 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 support networks um so we know that in in recovery from an eating disorder um having support networks is really really important um so we also incorporate that into our research that we um, you know bring in every participant that comes through our trial has to have a, a, an unidentified support person who can walk that journey with them um, and we try and involve them in the process where we can um, so yeah I feel like I've now done a bit bit of a long ramble but um, uh, that's kind of how we approach psychedelic therapy at um, in our trials at Imperial. Thanks so much for explaining that so clearly um... Yeah, I think we get lost a lot of the times in explaining, you know, what is psychedelic psychotherapy? That was just so cut and dry. Thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, I also wanted to acknowledge that you said that recovery is a daily process. And I almost started tearing up when you said that, because I'm like, shit, like it is, it, it's, you know, every meal, every decision to, in your day has to do with recovery. And so that was very like validating for me. To, so I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, did anybody have anything they wanted to, to comment on that Meg said before I move on? I guess just just jumping off that that point about recovery, I think it's again, yeah, that's so important. Because I think sometimes there can be a lot of pressure to achieve this, what's thought of as a perfect recovery. And recovery means different things to different people. It, it's an ongoing process. It may not be to meet kind of the goals of what the, the medical model says. Uh, that you need to achieve a certain BMI and that like that's kind of the be all end all of your wellness like there's so many different factors that play into it and people are at different stages in terms of, of their their own goals for their lives so I think really appreciating the nuances of that is, is vital. I think one of the one of the real difficulties in recovering from a from an eating disorder as opposed to another kind of addictive behavior like to a, a, a drug or, or something like gambling that um, can get really compulsive is we need food to survive. I mean, we're, we, we can't just we can't just eliminate the behavior from our repertoire and so, it has to be a transformative experience where we relearn our relationship with food and our bodies. And it, it's, it takes time, it takes a lot of effort. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about how the current treatment options aren't ideal. Um, we haven't actually talked a lot about the success rate of them, but I, I think the kind of consensus is, Nikita, you wanna to touch on that? Oh. I can kind of speak a little bit to basically we don't know because people mm -hmm. aren't again that takes money to research the outcomes and also I, I suspect like it's not going to be look it's not going to be good it's not going to be heartening for anyone to see and they so there isn't really any tracking of kind of yeah how people are just coming back but that's what we hear anecdotally and that's what people see on the ground is that it's the same people coming back and, and that's kind of evidence that it's not working. <laughs> Yeah. Do we, do we have any idea of how accepting the medical community would be of psilocybin therapy either now and perhaps if it was legalized? I've actually been really, really heartened um, by my interactions with colleagues and, uh, and kind of experts in, in the field as well. I think there is an openness and a receptiveness that I may not have necessarily expected. And it's, it's been really, really wonderful that this is something, I think it was very much more on the fringe even a couple of years ago and it's becoming more mainstream. People are drawing attention to it. And it's, for example, like the most recent Canadian Psychiatric Association conference, the keynote plenary was on psychedelic assistant treatment and people had lots of questions. There's definitely a lot of caution and reservation and people wanna see the evidence first before they're going to kind of, and which is fair and we, 
we need to do that research then and, and say like this works, it's safe. And we, we need to show that, but people, it seems are open. I think because there is this recognition that it, it, the system is broken. And, and so what can we, what can we do? Yep. Um, so Meg, let's, let's get that research out. <laughs> yes. I mean, I 100% I agree. The research needs to happen. We need to explore this. Um, uh, I, I think I'm. I, I agree. I'm. I, I think there is a shift in the medical community. And and another thing, it, it, you know, an important part of this is education. Um, you know, a lot of, of of our effort also needs to go into education about about um, you know about these drugs. People put them in their their. That's illegal. That means it's bad. Um, you know, don't want to even consider it box um, quite quickly. Whereas if you educate people around, you know, um, about how we use them within a therapeutic framework, um, people do tend to kind of open up to the idea a bit more. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, there, there is actually a recent paper out um, that it did a survey of, of 200 people um, with lived experience of eating disorders about whether they would, you know, do they support the research and whether they would um, consider it as a treatment option. And, and it, roughly half of the people um, uh, who were part of the study said that they would consider it uh, or consider being part of the research. Um, and um, you know, we did some public patient involvement work before our trial began, um, and and you know, people were quite receptive to the idea once they had the information. Um, so it's really about getting that information out there, both to the medical community and to um, you know service users and um, the general public. Thank you, Meg. And we do really appreciate the research that you're doing because I mean the the current research I believe is is quite thin on this. So um, yeah, if evidence is what's needed to to push this forward, then by golly, let's get some evidence because uh, we we desperately need new treatment options. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and just to add to that as well, like you know the, the the as the perspectives of people change and as people are becoming more open, we do need to to be doing all of the research and and understanding it more and understanding how to how to harness it properly and how to how to harness it for the right people at the right time. Um, uh, because we, you know, because the research was halted for so long, we've fallen so far behind, we've got a lot of ground to make up. Um, but it is really important that the research is done so that we can really lay those solid foundations. And I think one thing to note is with, with psychedelics in particular, research can be challenging because we have kind of in medicine, this like hierarchy of evidence that, that we, and at the top, at the pinnacle are, randomized double blind control trials. And that's not always necessarily feasible. It doesn't, that design may not make the most sense for certain things. I mean, anecdotal evidence is evidence too. It, it's not kind of, it, again, there's, there's diff, different levels. And so hearing about people's experiences and it, it's been really, really, I think eye-opening. And I think for a lot of clinicians, it does really open their mind to it. Even hearing about that before we get the Kind of the official data but yeah getting that data is is also very important in terms of getting approvals and regulations uh, to be able to actually provide these to, to folks and an another thing that i really love is that this melds again like psychopharmacology and then therapy uh in a way that often there's this divide in psychiatry it's like a like a false dichotomy and this really brings both there, there's a substance that's really helping to open you up and, and gain insight and benefit more from the therapeutic work, which I think a lot of people are excited by. And sorry, I'm, I'm just gonna chime in and say one more thing. Uh, I promise it's really brief. Um, uh, I just wanna also build on, on something else that Nikita said where um, it, you mentioned that, you know, that people are quite open to this kind of fringe, what used to be quite fringe is becoming um, you know, more into people's perspectives. And, and that's another thing that I think is really excited about, uh, or I get really excited about, about this is that this is, you know, it, it opens people up to all sorts of different kinds of fringe treatments that or things that were thought of as a bit far out previously, things like yoga and meditation and all of these other approaches that might be really useful, but people put in the kind of 
that's a bit too different for me um, category. You know, if people can be open to the idea of psychedelic therapy, surely they can be open to all of these other ideas too and how we can incorporate them into larger models um, rather than just focusing on like one thing, kind of we box therapies just like we box, you know, diagnoses. Um, but if we can start thinking about how to bring them together to build, you know, build a foundation of, of better approaches to mental health, then we can stop these or we can move away from the sort of more ambulance at the bottom of the cliff models and move more towards generating a society where, where we can support each other to have better mental health. Sorry, side run. Oh, beautifully said, Meg. Really appreciate that and very potent. Um, we do have several questions in the chat, but before we, we jump into those, um, I just wanted to ask, so why do you think, I guess this is uh, as succinctly as you can say, why do you think that psilocybin therapy needs to be researched and or regulated um, for medical purposes, specifically for eating disorders? Why do we need access? because it works. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that certainly the anecdotal um, evidence is very clear. And the, and the, the research evidence that is, is coming in is also very clear that these are very powerful tools for change and um, applying them to um, this, this particular class of disorders with the highest mortality rate of all psychiatric disorders it just makes sense that we give it a give it a try. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. And other than evidence, do you think there's anything else that could could push this forward for regulators, for healthcare professionals? Um, to Pop make this popular happen? pressure. Yeah. Um, just like just like what happened with cannabis, I think. So um, talk to your doctors about, uh, about, you know, am I a good candidate for it? And yeah, get the, get the message out there that this is something that, that you're interested in and, and you want access to. Awesome. And I'll, I'll, sorry, Nikita, you're going to say something. Go ahead. I was just going to add that like a lot of doctors, like they, they just may not be familiar with this even. And they may be very open. Like if you are aware of some trials that are going on that you could be referred to, like it, it's, yeah, they, they aren't really gonna know about it. I wouldn't expect them to. So it's, it's more kind of, it, we got patients are required to take it on themselves and uh, there is an openness though. Yeah, and I think also, you know, just um, building these, these containers of understanding and education around these these substances and how how they they you know how we're researching them how they might be used in the future in therapy i think that's really important um, you know we've got to have this safe container um, for psychedelics as well um, so it's all it all needs to kind of come together um, but the research i think is key the research needs to happen we need to know how um, to use them in therapy um, how how that what this therapy model is going to look like and i think the you, you know the research is 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 a the first step in that, from my perspective. And I, I think that the impetus really comes from, like like Ellen said, like people are dying and not just dying, people are suffering, uh, and it's not not okay that we have things that could help them, uh, and they aren't able to access it. So that's really why we need to we need to push. Absolutely, thank you. And yeah, I just put a little um, note in the chat here that, as I mentioned earlier, we are advocating for for change so that this can be accessible through research. This can be accessible, you know, through consultation with a physician, through consultation with your um, therapist, so that ideally, you know, this can be a first line defense, um, if not a second line defense for um, mental health and particularly eating disorders in the hopefully near future. Um, so with that, I am cognizant of time. I'd love to just jump into some of the questions. Um, Brian has a question for us saying, is there, is there any anecdotal reports with microdosing for eating disorders um, similar, similar to what we just heard from um, Ellen regarding macro dosing? Is anybody microdosing for this? 
I guess I can wait. So having heard from, from people, like sometimes microdosing is used and it, it can, I guess the context I've heard it in is more treating kind of like associated like mood and anxiety and, and things on a day-to-day -day basis versus like providing kind of profound like insight and, and impetus to really like change things with respect to the eating disorder. Um, but I don't know if others have different stories they've heard. There isn't a lot of science uh, around microdosing yet. Um, as I understand, um, a big study uh, through Quantified Citizen that followed something like 14,000 participants worldwide. I, I guess they're, they're coming through the data now and, and we'll be learning more about what they find as far, but I, I believe that will, I, that will be qualitative. It, so it will, well, the jury is still out as to whether or not it's really viable. Yeah, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say, due to the nature of eating disorders and how they're so ingrained in, in one's identity and various aspects of your life and how they're often tied to, you know, trauma or other comorbidities, I really don't know how successful microdosing would be to really get somebody out of that deep trench. I, I personally believe that one would need a macrodose and a really, you know, transformative experience. Um, to be successful, but that's just my own personal opinion based on literally zero fact. So um, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> and I guess something that's interesting to note as well is that with these macro doses even, um, kind of anecdotally, like people with eating disorders often require much, much higher doses than one would expect. Like the dosing for, for psychedelic treatment isn't necessarily weight-based or like the, the effect it can have. Um, it may be that somebody, and, and it, could have to do with kind of how rigid the thinking patterns are, but really like much higher than you would expect doses. Um, so. Very fair. Yeah. Um, next question is, are there any medical concerns for, um, for trip for someone quite underweight or otherwise medically stable? So I, just to rephrase, I think it's, you know, are there any safety or medical concerns for somebody in an active eating disorder? Um, undergoing such a transformative experience that, you know, you're taking a high dose of magic mushrooms. Is there any, and, and maybe Meg, you can speak to this. I don't know if there was a particular like uh, anti-qualifications, anti-requisites for being in the study or, yeah. Yeah, so uh, exclusion and inclusion criteria. Um, yeah. Yes, we, we, <laughs> so we do, we do have, in our trials at the moment, we do have relatively strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, uh, and that's because we are so early days in the research. Um, uh, but as, um, as Nikita's already mentioned, um, I think in the, in the question in the, in the chat, it specifically asks about people who are underweight. And um, uh, as Nikita's already mentioned, you know, it might be that people need um, a, a higher dose um, uh, when, they're, when they're really stuck, um, uh, which kind of goes against what you would expect, um, but it fits with what we understand about sort of how psychedelics work psychologically. Um, we know, you know, we know that, that psychedelics are incredibly safe as, um, or physiologically safe as drugs um, compared to most of the other um, uh, drugs that people take on a regular basis, uh, you know, alcohol, caffeine, even, um, you know, uh, psychedelics are incredibly safe. Um, I would be more sort of, I'm more kind of, uh, you know, cognizant of the, of the, the psychological, um, you know, making sure that someone's psychologically safe. Um, to take psychedelics necessarily than physically. Um, but in saying that, yes, we do have um, quite strict, we have um, sort of uh, BMI requirements and we do have um, uh, requirements in terms of, you know, when people are screened, um, we do bloods, we do ECGs, um, all of those kinds of things to make sure that someone is, is quite stable physically at this point. Um, at this, where the research is at this point, that we need to kind of maintain that. Um, yeah. Great, thanks, Meg. Um, next question, uh, this is actually from my mom. Good question, mom. Um, just intuitively, if psychedelics can shorten the treatment and recovery process, then that in itself would be worth it. However, people with eating disorders and frequently treatment averse, how important would it be to ensure that a patient is ready to accept this kind of treatment for it to be successful? 
I guess this isn't something you can force on someone in, in any way. That would be quite traumatic, I think. Um, and there's also, again, like, uh, yeah, this kind of ambivalence towards treatment. And, and that's so ingrained within the disorder. It's, it's serving a purpose. Like, I think this speaks a bit to the IFS and the parts. Um, there, there is, it, it has been a, helping people in some way. And so letting go of that is very challenging, even if it's not serving them anymore in the same way. Um, and so kind of gentle encouragement, giving people hope. I think if they hear that it's, it's something that may help, it's not something you can force someone into, but um, I, I do think that you can really try and try and educate them and let them know that it's an option. I'd just like to reiterate Meg's three three part process to the treatment that there has to be preparation and there has to be integration. That the the medicine is really just a part of the of the program and. It's the bookends of, of the preparation and then figuring out what happened that in, in some ways is, is more important. Um, so taking the time to be adequately prepared, going through those sessions. Um, I'm, I am, I've drunk the IFS Kool-Aid, so um, I, I believe that that's a, a, a model that really is helpful in, pre in preparing people and uh, and making sure that all the parts are on board and ready for what might happen. Thanks, Ellen. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And thank you, Nikita, as well. It's, yeah, I think just regular treatment, you know, going into group therapy or outpatient program or inpatient program, that's not something you can force on somebody either. Somebody has to be supremely ready to accept help. Um, and I think especially going into a psychedelic journey, like that's that's a big decision to make. And yeah, you have to be mentally ready to, to undergo that. So um, two more. Mm, go, go Sorry, ahead. I just to add to that, maybe the, you know, psychedelics can help people to make that decision to be mm -hmm. ready to recover, you know? Um, uh, because we know that, uh, you know, motivation to recover is, is one of those kinds of things that people identify as, as a, a roadblock to, to the recovery process. Um, so maybe we can help people to, to be more engaged in the idea, give people the hope that, that recovery, you know, that, that process that, that might be long and uncomfortable might be worth it um, because their lives are worth it because, you know, having, having uh, engendering that self-compassion and that self-love um, I think, I think that is, is something that, that, um, psychedelic therapy offers. And we've talked about this, you know, the word compassion and love have come up already in this conversation. Um, and, um, you know, that's something that psychedelic therapy offers that a lot of, um, or most current eating disorder treatments don't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, got two more minutes. We have two more questions. Hopefully we can get to them both. If not, I'm so sorry. Um, the first one is, can somebody speak to people who literally can't wait to access psilocybin legally? Um, I, yeah, is anybody willing to speak on that? It's a difficult one because, you know, psilocybin, it's an illegal compound right now. Um, even as our ad, we're, we're an advocacy organization, and people message us all the time, can you refer me to a therapist who is trained in psychedelic psychotherapy? And unfortunately we, we can't. Um, we can only help folks who have section 56 exemptions right. to, to undergo this legally, but did, does anybody else have uh, suggestions? There are, there are legal um, ketamine clinics that are popping up all over. And um, that is one, one route to experience psychedelic assisted therapy, um, yeah. But I, as far as I know, a lot of the, the, the places, they have long waiting lists too already. But there, there are more, there will be more and more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I'll just say, you know, the, the research is happening and, and I'm really hopeful that, that, you know, that this will change. I don't know what treatments for eating tools are going to look like in the future, but this will hopefully spur some change on. Um, so the research is coming, we're coming for you to, you know, to the research is there to help move this along. And hopefully it won't be, you know, it won't be too long of a wait to see the face of eating disorder treatments change. Absolutely. Um, 
And with that, we are at, um, well, it's three o'clock my time and I am a stickler for time. So I will wrap it up here. I will say, clearly there's a lot of people on this call who are, are passionate about the fact that psilocybin therapy, psychedelic psychotherapy needs to move forward. It needs to be accessible um, now because people are already accessing psilocybin therapy now, just maybe underground or illegally or with unregulated professionals. So we need to, to make sure that this is accessible in a safe and effective manner. If this is something you're passionate about and you wanna help the cause, uh, please go to our website, therasil.ca. We have many different ways that you can um, get involved in advocacy. Um, feel free to email me, uh, myself as well, holly at therasil.ca. If any of the panelists um, feel like putting their contact information in, in the chat, feel free to do so. Um, and I'll just uh, pass along if there's any closing, closing thoughts before we wrap up and get people on with their day. I put my my Gmail address in the chat. Happy to talk to people about um, about options, and um, just want to again thank you for allowing me to participate here. It's uh, an important topic to me. Yeah. Of course, thanks so much, Ellen. And I would also just say, you know, there are there's our trial at Imperial College going on, but there are other trials across the world. So um, do if you're kind of interested in, in um, volunteering for one of these trials, you'll find information on all of them on clinicaltrials.gov and there might be one near you. Um, so do look out um, for those as well. And thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thank you. Echoing these sentiments, I put my contact in the chat. Uh, Please reach out anytime. So, so thankful for this opportunity. Awesome. I really appreciate um, all three of you and everybody who, uh, who attended today. Thanks for taking an hour out of your day, your time, your energy to talk about this. And uh, together we can move this forward and make this a real, a real treatment option. So um, thank you all. And uh, we'll see you at our next webinar, which I guess is next week. So uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank Have you. a good one. Bye. Take care. Bye.